Let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 through 11 as we have just begun a study here in 1 Samuel. And uh, we'll be looking at Hannah's prayer this morning here in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. Tonight we have our evening service and we obviously have our midweek on Wednesday. And like I was sharing with you last week, it would be good if you were to choose a place to come for an evening service if you're able and, and plug in. And so we do have our evening service. We're in the book of Ruth and then on Wednesday we continue our study in uh, the gospel of Luke. And so I'd love to have you with us if you're able. Uh, Mike mentioned the ministry fair. You can see what that is in a couple of weeks. It's the kinds of ministries that we have here and uh, where you might want to plug yourself in. Super Bowl is coming up uh, in the Super Bowl weekend, and so we have our men's breakfast. We're going to have Miles McPherson with us, and some of you have been with us as Miles has Miles have been out here with us more than once, and he's always a blessing. And um, he pastors a church in the San Diego area. Um, they have five Sunday morning services, and he has a 3,500-seat sanctuary. The Lord has just used him tremendously, and it's always a blessing when Miles comes out and shares with us, and so I'd invite you to be part of that, fellas, when that takes place at the end of the month. And then, uh, finally, we do have our couple's banquet that's coming up in February on the 13th, and that's for uh, dating as well as married couples, and if you'd like to be part of that, of course, we'd love to have you with us. Today, we're in chapter 2 here in 1 Samuel. We'll read verses 1 through 11 as we continue our study that we just began in the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to be looking at a section that I chose just to call Hannah's Prayer. It's going to be obvious as to why I called it that in just a moment, because it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest, As we have been looking at First Samuel, we know that Hannah had been barren, married to a man by the name of Elkanah. Elkanah had a, a second wife, a woman by the name of Penina. And Penina was able to have children, and because Penina was having children and Hannah did not have any, Penina would mock and would cause great pain to Hannah because Penina would let her know that she felt herself to be favored even though Hannah was the one who truly was favored by the husband, Elkanah. It caused her great pain, and so Hannah had taken this request to the Lord. She had actually prayed in bitterness of spirit and, and had spoken to God and had said to the Lord, God, I want you to give me an ability to have a child. In, in chapter 1, at verse 11, she had said to him, uh, if he was to give her a child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She had said, Lord, if you give me the ability to have this child, I will dedicate him to your service for all of his life. And so she had gone to the tabernacle. The priest Eli was there, and Eli watched her as she was praying and could see her lips were moving, but no sound was coming from her mouth, and therefore he thought that she was drunk. And he approached her and he said to her, she should put away her wine. How dare you come into the tabernacle and pollute it in this fashion? She immediately says, listen, it's not because I'm drunk that I'm here. I'm here praying. I'm a woman of sorrowful heart. 
because I desire to have a child. I'm barren. I'm unable to have one. So Eli, receiving from the Lord a, a word, says to her, you need to just go on home because God has heard your request. So with joy, she goes home. And as she goes home, over a period of time, she and Elkanah have normal uh, relationships. She becomes pregnant, conceives this child, and is greatly excited about it. And so she says to her husband, I'm not going to be going up to, to uh, the tabernacle until I've weaned Samuel. And so we know that in the time of, of Samuel that the mama would continue nursing the baby up to three years. And so now, after three years have passed, she has taken this child to dedicate him to the Lord. And so in verse 20, 28 of chapter 1, uh, she says there, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And they worship the Lord there. And so he's three years old. She's dropping him off at the tabernacle. He's about to begin his service to the Lord. And she's going to leave him there for the rest of his life. And the question has to be asked, how does she feel? How does she feel about this? What's going on in her heart? You see, she has taken this request and she gave it to the Lord. She had prayed to God. She had asked him for a son. And she said, I will offer him to you for service. She said, he will be a servant. He will live a holy life all the days of his life. And therefore, she came to God, the God who was able, and she made a request known to him. She knew that this God was not like the gods of the pagan. She knew that this God was not the God of the heathen. This is not a distant and incapable of hearing type God. This is a God who's able to, to, to minister. He is with us. He's near to us. And all she needs to do is make her, her request made known to him because she knew that prayer was a conversation that she was having with her God. And that's what prayer is. It's a conversation that we have with God. It, it's a subject of a lot of Bible. I mean, when you start in Genesis, go to Revelation, there are over 350 distinct prayers that are recorded for us in Scripture. You see that prayer is the heartbeat of a believer. And there are times that you speak to the Lord in a variety of ways. There are times that you might be praying to God in, in a way that you're simply giving Him thanks for the good things that He's done. There are times that you're giving to the Lord in, in, your, in your prayer just a, a lot of praise for the goodness that He has, has been to you, how good He's been. There are times that you're, you're lifting up your supplications to God where you're, you're making a request known to Him, something personal, something you desire. There are times that you're interceding, you're speaking for somebody else. You're saying, God, in Jesus' name, I'm lifting up this person to you. There are times that when you're praying, you're actually making a complaint to him. You're saying, Lord, I just have to, to let you know how I feel about what's going on. And then there are other times that you might be simply asking him a, a series of questions. It's prayer. It, it's conversation with God. And it's something that Hannah was very familiar with. And she would bring these requests to the Lord. And she did so because she knew that God would answer. You see, God actually in, in Scripture gives to us an invitation to approach him. In Jeremiah, in chapter 33, verse 3, he said, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and, and show you great and mighty things which, which you know not. God actually gives to us an invitation to approach his throne and uh, to bring our requests to him. He invites us to do that. Now, before I was saved, I, I might pray because people do. But I never had a confidence that he was listening. I didn't know that he actually is listening to me. I always sensed that there was some kind of separation. There was something that was dividing us. And I didn't know what it was. But as I got saved, I came to realize what it was. And what was dividing, what was making separation, was my sin. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. There was a sin separation, something that was making uh, my conversation with God well, was blocking it. And, and when I got saved, that, that sin separation was dealt with. And, and, and because of the Lord Jesus Christ, now I can come to him with a, a full confidence that he's listening to me. I can come to the Lord and, and speak to him and, and know that he listens because I have been forgiven by God. Ephesians 2.13 says, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so I can now approach him. I can come to the Lord and speak to him. Hebrews 10.19 says, We now have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So as Christians, we know that God hears us because we know that God loves us. Access has become ours. We can come to him as his children whenever we need to speak to him. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. 
And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace, obtaining mercy and find help in our time of need because God has made that way available to us. We can pray, and that's what Hannah is doing. Now, sometimes when you're praying, you can have the sense that maybe, maybe he's not going to answer. Maybe there's something that I have to deal with. You know, I've discovered that sometimes when I pray, my prayer may be just an extremely selfish prayer. It's just selfish. Now, there's this program that's coming on real soon. Some of you have seen it. Others won't admit to it that you've watched it. But it's called American Idol. American Idol. A lot of people watch it, especially the beginning programs when you see these people come up who cannot sing and, and they, they try so hard. And, and you sit there guiltily kind of laughing, saying, oh, God, I feel so guilty, but this, I, you, I can't believe this. And so you watch it as this person's out there trying to sing. But don't you think that that person, before they went up to do their, their song, don't you think they were praying and saying, God, I'd like to be an American Idol? They are. They're saying, God, help me to win. And I've discovered that sometimes the Lord says, no. <laughs> you can't sing. I gave up praying when I was watching my favorite team play a long time ago because he never answers yes. Lord, let UCLA beat the Trojans just this one time, God. And he says, no, 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 no. It doesn't work, you know. So I gave up a long time ago. I don't pray for athletic contests. I just watch and suffer. There are some things that you can ask for that the Lord is not even going to dignify with an answer. Sometimes we're asking because we're asking incorrectly. It's kind of like what James says in chapter 4, verse 3, when he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your lust. You're asking for the wrong thing. You see, according to 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, we should pray according to the will of God. And if we know that we're praying according to His will, we also know that we have the petitions we've requested of Him. When you ask according to His will. Well, sometimes we, we, we may pray, but we don't even expect God to answer. We're not expecting Him to respond to us at all. It's kind of like we just throw the prayer up in the air, hoping that somebody up there might be listening but the Bible tells us we're to ask in faith without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. A, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't be asking for one thing with no intent to actually receive it. You pray with faith, but sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes the Lord just doesn't give us his, uh, the answer simply because it doesn't line up with his will for us. So, so we need to know that God does answer prayer. Uh, uh, God will answer yes. God may answer no. And then sometimes God answers wait. But we lift our requests and we ask the Lord if he might move. And we do so because we know that God is good and we know that God loves us. So that's what had happened with Hannah. Hannah had taken her broken heart to the Lord God, and she had made her request of him. And uh, as, she had, as she had made her prayer to him, the Lord had stated that he would, he would answer through uh, Eli, and she was able to go home. And so as she's gone home, she has received the answer of the Lord. She finally brought the baby and dedicated the baby, and she's leaving him there with him. As it says in verse 28, chapter 1 again, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he'll be lent to the Lord. And they worship the Lord there. And so now Hannah begins to pray. And in chapter 2, verse 1, we have a chance to see what she prays. Is she upset? Is she, is she discouraged? Is she sad? She's leaving her three-year-old behind. She's about to leave and go home without the joy of her heart. This is a three-year-old baby that has been everything to her, the answer to her prayer. And she's going to leave this baby there with Eli, and, and she's going to leave him and go home by herself. She's been with him for three years. She's been nursing him, loving him, speaking to him, training him, devoting herself to him. By the time he's three years of age, he's already learning prayers. He's able to communicate. There are things about this three-year-old that must have just grabbed her heart. She loves him with everything that's within him, within her. But what's going to go on? How does she respond? Well, notice what she says in verse 1 here. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemy because I rejoice in your salvation. Hannah begins by saying, 
my heart rejoices in the Lord. When she says my heart, that speaks of her center of moral and spiritual life. She says everything within me is rejoicing. It's not a time of sadness. It's not a sad time of letting go. It's a moment of triumphant rejoicing. God has answered my prayer. I am overjoyed. She says my horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. When she says, my horn is exalted, that word horn in the Old Testament refers to various things. It can include my pride, it can include military, it can include political power. Uh, normally it speaks of strength because an ox is a very powerful animal and they would use the horn as a symbol of the strength. And so she's speaking about the strength that she has and she's saying, I have an inner strength that has been given to me. It's been produced by God's goodness as he strengthens me. And as a result of that, I smile at my enemies. I smile at them because I rejoice in your salvation. Your, your salvation has caused any sorrow that I could have within my heart to be turned to joy. And this inner joy that you have given to me causes me to smile. That which is on the inside has found a place of expression on the outside. My heart is smiling and so is my mouth. And I have come to worship you and I've come to give praise to you because you have been good to me. I rejoice in your salvation. Isaiah 61 verse 3 uh, God promises there to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so she's saying, you have given to me the joy of my heart and the great desire of my heart, and I smile at those who at one time have been oppressing me. She goes on in verse 2, and she says, no one is holy like the Lord. There's none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. This is my joy. These, these are the reasons for my joy. I am joyful because you are holy. I am joyful because you are without equal. In the multitudes of the so-called gods, there is only one God, and that God is my God. There is no rock like our God. When she says, nor is there any rock like our God, a rock is immovable. It's enduring. It gives a picture of strength, and it gives to us an insight that God is there to help us when we're in our times of need. She's rejoicing because the Lord of might, the God of all strength, strength has heard her cry and he has listened to her. He is her God and he is her, her stability. So she speaks now and verse 3 is interesting because she's undoubtedly addressing this really to uh, uh, what she's gone through with uh, Penina. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth for the Lord is the God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. Now notice, the Lord is the God of knowledge. When it says the Lord is the God of knowledge, God has every kind of knowledge because God is omniscient. God knows everything. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 44, 21, he knows the secrets of the heart. Or Psalm 147, 5, great is our Lord, mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. God knows all things, is what she's saying. And he's able to judge righteously. God has seen what you have done, Penina. How arrogant and proudful you have been towards me. And God has heard my cry. God is the only one who is able to righteously judge. You know, sometimes somebody on the outside, you look at them and you'll say, man, that's a good guy. Or that sure is a beautiful person there. Because on the outside, they look that way. They use good words. They can sometimes even speak religiously and and you may look at them and all on the outside, they look like they're a very righteous person. And then there are other people that you see them from the outside and you would think the opposite of them. You would think that this is a rough person. This is an ungodly person. I have met some guys who are huge. I mean, they're just huge guys who have such gentle and loving hearts. They love the Lord and they would, they would give you the shirt off your back so you could make a tent out of it. I mean, they're so big. They're just great guys, you know. But if you look at them at first, you know, you're thinking, oh, this is, but it turns out, no, you know, outer appearances can fool you. We don't have the ability to judge a person's heart. And that's the point she's making. She's saying God does. God has all knowledge. God knows what's inside of them. When the hippies were getting saved and we would share uh, our faith with, with people who were not hippies, all they could see was, was the long hair and the bare feet, and they didn't want to hear the gospel. They couldn't see our heart. All they could see was the outer appearance. 
Today, when, when kids get saved and they've got tattoos all the way down to their fingernails and they've got piercings and everything, a lot of times all the people can see is the piercings, all they can see is the tattoos. They, they don't see the heart. They can't see the heart. But that heart is right with God and that heart's a good heart towards the things of the Lord. But because people have a tendency of judging on the outer appearance, well, we need to understand that God sees the heart. And so that's what she's saying here. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. The Lord is a God of knowledge. By Him, actions are weighed. God sees all things. She says in verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumble are girded with strength. So she begins to speak how God works. She begins by saying the mighty are weakened, but the weak are made mighty. The proud can be reduced to a place of humility, but the humble are lifted to prominence. Proverbs 3.34 says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. So God works through humility. Secondly, she says in verse 5, Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. And so she goes on to say, Those who are rich or full, that would speak of the landowners, the landowners who are working in their own fields and the servants who are now at rest. So she's saying God has a way of taking the powerful and reducing them and the weak and elevating them. She says in verse 5, Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. God has made it, made it possible for the barren to be perfectly happy. The number seven in, in Scripture is a, is a sign of perfection or completeness. And so she's, it's a picture of somebody being perfectly happy. And so she's saying even a person who didn't have children can be made perfectly happy in the Lord and even have many children. It's interesting how that she had been barren and had Samuel, but Samuel's not the only one that she speaks of. Notice in chapter 2 here, verse 21. Notice what it says in chapter 2, verse 21, how it says, The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. She went on to have six children altogether, not just the one that she had, but she had five more. And so she's saying, God has made it possible for me to be perfectly happy in him. She goes on in verse 6 to say, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. It is the Lord, she is saying, who gives life. Only he has the ability to give life, and only he is the one who takes it away. When you read the book of Job in chapter 1, verse 21, Job said it this way. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is all-powerful, and he is the God of life. She says in verse 7, The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. And so God has a way of putting into our, into our hands an ability to gain riches, and sometimes he even removes riches from us. Our financial situation often rests on our relationship with the Lord. And so she says God is able to make someone rich and somebody else poor, but it's God who is the one who is in charge of all of that. Verse 8, he, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. God can put you in a place that you have no intrinsic rights or abilities to inhabit. God is able to do that. When I um, consider that, I, I think I have a bit of understanding in that one verse there. He lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes. God has been extremely good to me. And as I look in this room, I believe that God has been extremely good to all of us. You know, God has a way of working things out to put you in a position that you may realize you're not qualified for. And yet, he places you in that position. You may be somebody working in an office or in a warehouse or wherever it may be, and you started in a certain position, but now you are a supervisor, you're overseeing things, you may be being moved up into the company ladder, and they're giving you more and more. And yet you're thinking within yourself, I don't deserve this because I didn't graduate from college, didn't even go to college. And yet you may be saying, and yet look where I'm at. 
I'm overseeing responsibility, and there are guys here with master's degrees or even doctorates that I have, I have a, 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 an overseer relationship with, and you, you feel so humbled because you're put in that position because you have some experience you gained. You gained it in life. Perhaps you served in the military, gained some experience there, but you are now a supervisor in a place that is filled with guys who have uh, upper degrees, and yet you don't have that. And, and you look at it and you think, Lord, you're too much. How did you put me in this position? How did I get here? How did you place me here? It's because God has a way of taking you from one place and putting you somewhere else. God has a way of doing that. God has a way of taking you and elevating you and putting you in a position that he wants you to be regardless of whether or not you feel the ability to do that, regardless of whether you have the qualifications or the education. God has a way of doing that and he places you in that position and it blows your mind when he does. And you see what you are doing and how God has been good to you and it just amazes you at the goodness that God has shown to you. I understand that. I remember getting an in invitation several years ago. The first one I received, I received more than this, but the first one I received, I re remember getting a call saying, you've been invited to come to the White House, but you have to send some, um, your driver's license information and all pertinent information that relates to you. You have to send it to the FBI. They're going to have to screen you to see whether or not they're going to allow you in or not. And I remember Marie and I having to jump through all those hoops and finally they sent us an invitation where to meet there in, a, in a, a small meeting with the President of the United States. And how that we jumped on a plane, flew to D.C., went to the hotel, the next day, you know, got dressed, went, you go to this little gate, you give them your license, you give them your name, they run you through, they send you through this one gate, you go into another room, they interview you, you go through another gate, go through a, a check, uh, see if you're carrying any weapons, send you to a little elevator, go into the elevator and you go down in this room and you go in, then you go and you find seating in this small room with about, seats about a hundred people and you're in there and it's not full and you're just sitting there and a few, just a few rows from the podium, from the platform there, in a small, small room. And then as you're seated there, you hear the music and uh, then you hear somebody say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And, and everybody stands as he walks in. And you're, you're within 10 feet of this man that you see on TV all the time, and you know who he is. And I turn to Marie, and I look at her, and I say, some of you will understand this, some of you may not. But I looked at her and I said, who would think, the first time I was ever there, who would think? little Mexican guy from Norwalk in the same room with the President of the United States. I was humbled. I was humbled. Some people say, oh, I hate him. Just the idea of being there. <laughs> Just the idea that I was there. And I've been invited there more than once. You're humbled. You're humbled. I graduated from high school with a D minus average. That scares you, huh? <laughs> I cut classes in my senior year for the whole year. I showed up only for tests and once in a while just so they had me on the rolls. I was never in class. If they had me doing the detention that I should have been doing, because they used to give you an hour's detention if you cut a class, I'd still be making up all the hours, 41 years later. But God has a way of taking you from the ash heap and putting you among princes. He has a way of doing that. I was at a wedding two weeks ago, and as I was seated at the table, a woman approached me and walks up to me and looks at me and she says to me, excuse me, are you David, David Rosales? I said, yes, I am. Who wants to know? You know, how much do I owe you? No, yes, I am. She goes, I went to high school with you. <laughs> really? 
What's your name? She gives me her name. I knew her from high school, 41 years ago. I haven't seen her in 41 years. And as she's talking to me, she goes, we went to high school together. And I said, I remember you, of course. She says, now, who did you hang around with? I said, every troublemaker in high school was my friend. I hung around with that group. She says, like, and I started naming all the troublemakers I hung around with. I hung around with this guy, that guy. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We were, we were, we were the troublemakers in the school. We were the druggies. I mean, we were the ones who would go to lunch, get loaded, come walking in with sunglasses on and just sit there and crash for an hour. That was us. We were the ones who would go out drinking during lunchtime. We were the ones, we were the trouble in the school. My friends and I caused all the problems. We were the ones who made Sierra High School, class of 1968, the number one drug school in the Whittier Union High School District. It was us. And when it was announced that Sierra High School is the number one drug abusing high school, we cheered. Yeah, that was us. She remembers me. I said, all those guys, those were my friends. And you're a pastor now? <laughs> and I, I, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at what God has done. And I said, you need to come and visit us. Perhaps you will. Come and visit us. She lives in the area. Come and see what God has done. See what the Lord has done. I've had people come to church here. It's happened twice now where they have two different guys with different friends who have come and they said, I knew him from high school. He can't have changed like that. It's not possible that David's doing this today. But I have because of what the Lord has done. Because God has a way of taking the beggar from the ash heap and sets them among princes. God has a way of doing that. God has a way of doing amazing things God has a way of transforming your life. God has a way of putting you in places you don't deserve to be respected with an amount of respect that you really are not worthy of. But God has a way of doing that. He does have a way of placing you in places that, that you couldn't have opened the door, but God opened the door. God placed you in. God said, you be seated here because you are somebody I'm delighting in. And, and I am amazed, I'm amazed at the goodness that God has shown me. I, I, I am amazed because I married above my pay grade. I know that. I have four children that I adore and two grandbabies that are the, the heartbeat of my life. God has blessed me with friends and family and a church that, that, I, that I love with all of my heart. He is a God who gives you such great blessings and grace and benefits and goodness. He has a way of taking you. And all you need to do is begin to look at where you were and where you are now to see the hand of God, what God can do. What God can do. Look at where you were and look at where you are. And look what God has done. For me, 38 years of walking with Jesus Christ and I have seen God do amazing things that I do not deserve. And God is the one who does that. He has put me in places where I have opportunities. You know, I've traveled internationally to go to pastors' conferences, to teach pastors in Austria, to speak to them in various countries of the world, Mexico, and you name it. I've had opportunity to go to South America. I've had opportunity to go to Israel more times than I can even remember to do ministry in so many places, to speak in front of thousands of people, like at the Anaheim Men's Conference and and, and men's conferences throughout the nation. I have seen God, and, and I am amazed by it, and there are times when I just am overwhelmed by it like you I see God's hand on me and and what God is doing and and I am amazed and you ought to do the same you ought to be looking back and saying God you have been so good to me look at what you've done look how good you've been you have done so much and the thing is he's able to do abundantly above all we could ask or even think And so Hannah's praying and praising God and rejoicing in him. The one who was barren has been given seven children. In other words, she is saying, I am perfectly happy because I have seen what you have done, God. You've taken the humble and placed them in a place where they can be used. And those who thought they were to be used, you've humbled them. Look at what you have done. You are the God who does this. She says in verse 8, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world upon them. God, you're, you're the one who keeps all things stable. You keep this world from crashing in and of itself and upon itself. 
Even as Psalm 102, 25 says, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the works of your hands. And we know according to Hebrews 1, 3 that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. You are the one who keeps all things together. You are the one who keeps things solid. He will guard the feet of his saints. But the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. God's people follow him. And he leads them in security and righteousness. He protects them every step of the way. Even as it says in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. God takes care of you and he leads you in the path that he would have you to go. Paths of peace and paths of righteousness. But the unrighteous live in darkness and they stumble and ultimately are left in darkness. Matthew 25, 30, Jesus says, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, because by strength, no man shall prevail. A man or a woman is made strong when they give up, when they yield, when they say, enough, I'm sorry, God forgive me. By strength, I cannot prevail. By my own effort, by my own power, I can never accomplish anything for God. It's only what I do by the power of God's Spirit that ever counts for anything. I cannot prevail. I cannot do. I cannot save myself. I cannot be victorious in life. And neither can you. But when you walk with the Lord, God opens doors no man can close. And God places you in positions to be used. And because your heart is right with him, God is glorified through you. But when you're walking outside of the Lord, you walk in darkness. And ultimately, that's where you remain. He says in verse 10, the, she says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven, he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Ultimately, the enemies of the Lord, the adversaries, will be broken. This is a prophecy because she's speaking concerning, and I want you to see this in the last portion of chapter uh, 2, verse 10, where it says, He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That word anointed there, the horn of his anointed, that word anointed is speaks of Messiah. The anointed is Mashiach in the Hebrew. It speaks of Messiah. And she's saying ultimately victory is going to come. If this is a prophetic word. Ultimately victory comes uh, through Messiah. Messiah is bringing victory. The adversaries will be crushed and all who oppose Messiah, Jesus, will be overwhelmed. Under his anointed, all enemies will be vanquished. In Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9, the psalmist said, I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Jesus Christ ultimately is going to be victorious. And she's prophesying concerning the Messiah who ultimately will come and deliver the nation of Israel as well as all who believe in him. And so as she's praying, she's simply saying this. She's saying, I came to God with a broken heart. I had an adversary by the name of Penina, Alkanah, my husband's second wife. She was jealous concerning me because obviously Alkanah loved me. I couldn't produce children for him, so he married a second woman. She produced children and used those children as a weapon against me. It broke my heart. It got me to the point where I was inconsolable. But I took my need to the Lord. And though it seemed like an impossibility, I asked God, would you please make it possible for me to have a child? And God granted my petition. But I had said to God, I will give this child to you to serve you in holiness all the days of his life. 
And I have come in order that I might dedicate Samuel to service because God has heard my request. I don't walk away from this place crying. I walk away from this place rejoicing because God has given to me the desire of my heart. And I asked him if he would, and he did. And as he has done so, I dedicate this child to service to God, and this child shall serve him all the days that he lives. And it says in verse 11, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. And so she leaves him there at that tabernacle. She leaves Samuel there to the work of the Lord. And as she leaves, she leaves him thinking that he's in a location, in a place where he's going to learn things that will make him a more righteous child. But the sad fact is that even in that tabernacle, even as this child is dedicated to serving God, even in this holy environment, unholiness is rampant. And we're going to be seeing that next time we get together. Even in the midst of a place that is dedicated to God, there is an unholiness that is finding places of expression. We'll see that next time. Father, I ask that you would work in us. I ask that you would continue to show us, Lord, your ways, that you would work within each one of us as we yield ourselves to you. Lord, we see that you are a God who answers prayer. There have been times that we have prayed, Lord, and haven't received from you because we have asked amiss, desiring to consume it on our own lusts. We, we ask for things, Lord, that really weren't of your will. Or we ask, Lord, sometimes not really sincerely expecting you to move at all. We know that you answer prayer. We know that you answer yes, you answer no. And sometimes you answer wait. But you do answer prayer, Lord. And so we would learn to pray too. We would learn to put our concerns and our cares upon you. We would learn that you are a God who is holy and just. And you are a God who elevates those, Lord, who humbly walk with you. Lord, I want to thank you for the goodness you've shown to us, to this fellowship, to many in this room, how you have put us in positions of influence, how you have worked in our lives and glorified yourself. How you transform people who yield to you. And I want to lift up this congregation, Lord, that we might learn to pray knowing that you are a God of all power and all knowledge. You already know our situations and you have the ability, Lord, to deliver us we would lift our concerns and conditions to you even right now. Some in this room, Lord, need a touch because their bodies are breaking down. Some in this room need a touch from you, Lord, because they're having difficulty making home payments, Lord. Or because, Lord, they're in danger of losing their job or they already have. Some are concerned for children, Lord. Some are concerned for their marriages. Some are concerned for their parents. Many are carrying burdens and hurts right now that only you are really fully aware of, Lord. So we lift these requests to you now, Lord, and I pray that you would reach down and show them that you are the God who is able. You are the God who cares. And may they walk out of this room trusting you, Lord, as they cast their cares on you even now. Our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed. Perhaps I have some in this room right now we need prayer. You need to get right with the Lord. You need to yield to him right now. I want to pray for you. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Just raise it so I can see you, please. Lord, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. I'm asking that you would reach down now and touch them. It represents needs, Lord, that these your children have. And I pray, Father, that you would bring comfort and that you would cause them even now to know you love them and you're concerned for them. And you're able to meet these needs, Lord. And I ask that as they raise their hand to you, that you would raise them, Lord. That they might walk with joy, knowing that you are in control. And they can trust you. Even as, as Hannah walked away rejoicing, may they walk away knowing that they've cast their care on you, and you care for them. Wash them and cleanse them, Lord. Where needed, fill them with your spirit. And work within them, Lord. 
that they might, from this day forward, just enjoy you and trust you in all of this. And we thank you, Lord, and bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us, that we would learn how to pray and learn who you are as we pray. And I ask this now in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll close with a, uh, with a song and a word of prayer. Our Father, we ask that you work in us and through us and that you use us for your glory. We leave this place into the mission field. We will serve you and may we be found faithful as we do so. Draw us back tonight, Wednesday, whenever, that we might continue fellowshipping, Lord, and growing in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.